Welcome back to The Real News Network and Reality Asserts Itself. And we're continuing our series of interviews with Norman Finkelstein, one of the world's probably best known outstanding critics of Israeli policy. And he joins us now in the studio. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. So the, uh, I've introduced Norman in all the other parts. So all you got to do is go look below the video player and you'll see. But just to say quickly, Norman is an author, he's an academic, and his most recent book is Method and Madness, The Hidden Story of Israel's Assaults on Gaza. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. So in the last segment, we kind of just began telling the story of the writing of the Holocaust industry. And amongst other things, this is a book that I think probably changed the course of your life. Um, you, you obviously, and you had to know, you were touching one of the most central nerves of American, the American Jewish population, global Jewish population, if you were. Um, the, the book, if I tell me, let me paraphrase it very quickly, essentially that Israel and the founders of the state of Israel and the Israeli government since and others that support it were using the Holocaust to justify an occupation and, and essentially war crimes, and it's a misuse of the memory of the Holocaust. Is that? Uh, well, there was a second aspect to it, which actually, at the time, uh, infuriated people more, which was, you might recall in that period, there, was all, there were all these claims about Holocaust compensation, how the Swiss banks had cheated Holocaust survivors, and these were big news stories, and here came these crusading lawyers who were going to uh, uh, get retribution for what were called needy Holocaust victims. And then there were the fat Swiss bankers, you know, the evildoers. And a large part of the book was devoted to showing that it was just a shakedown racket. Uh, and they, all these guys were crooks. The lawyers. Uh, the lawyers and the uh, whole apparatus, the World Jewish Congress, People like uh, not, or Edgar Bronfman at the time, a Rabbi Israel Singer, and then also. Um, why, and why were they shakedown artists? Was not this a legitimate claim no, to get com compensation? No, it was completely ridiculous to claim. Why? Uh, well, it was very simply put by the world's leading authority in the Nazi Holocaust, namely Raoul Hilberg. Uh, incidentally, as I recite the facts, let me just say as a foreground, uh, Raoul Hilberg was a conservative Republican. He swore by the Wall Street Journal. His politics were at the exact end of the opposite end of the spectrum from my own. But he was also an extremely scrupulous scholar and in a class all his own when it came to the question of the Nazi Holocaust. Uh, he had literally memorized the entire Nuremberg process, uh, which is several hundred volumes were tucked away in his uh, brain. Yeah, he was an extraordinary figure. And he happened to have, as he put it, he thumbed through the same pages as I did of the congressional record and all the relevant documents. And he said, interestingly enough, he said, my conclusions were conservative. Uh, they were conservative because I tend to be very cautious because I know one error and I'm going to be hung by it. So I'm very careful in what I claim and uh, make sure there's a, a voluminous documentation to support it. So here was the basic fact. Uh, as uh, Hilberg laid it out, and now I'm quoting him as against myself, there are three basic facts about Jews during world, uh, that in this period before World War II and during the Nazi Holocaust. Number one, Jews are overwhelmingly poor. They lived in shtetls in Eastern Europe. They don't have Swiss bank accounts. Number two, if you did happen to have a Swiss bank account, remember, we're in the midst of the worldwide depression. The depression meant if you had money, you lost it. That's why it was a crash. We call it a crash. And number three, if you did have money still, you were one of those rich Jews who managed to survive the depression. You didn't live in a shtetl. If you did have money, you used the money to get out of Nazi-occupied Europe which means you got out and after the war, you went to the bank and you withdrew your money. So there were no huge sums of money in Swiss banks which were deposited there by Jews and then they were cheated after World War II. Probably the total sum came to about 30 or $40 million, which were in the Swiss banks. And the Swiss bankers themselves, when the whole uh, hysteria began, 
they were willing to pay the $40 million. But the shakedown artists, people, like I said, like Rabbi Israel Singer, uh, Bert Newborn, the ACLU lawyer, uh, the big liberal, uh, all this, this gang of crooks, uh, they realized here was a, a double, you know, sort of like a, a double opportunity. One, they can come across as vindicating the Nazi Holocaust. Uh, and number two, they can make a lot of bucks out of it. Okay, I got to jump in here. I got to jump in here for just a second because mm -hmm. you're calling people crooks and all. Oh this. yeah, they were complete thieves. Okay, no, actually, no. most of them, a large number of them, strangely enough, a large number of them ended up in a lot of trouble with the law. Well, Robert, I got, just let me mm -hmm. say one thing because because uh -huh. I don't know enough about this uh -huh. to challenge Norman on mm -hmm. this, and and he's calling people crooks. So if anybody out there mm -hmm. wants to challenge and argue oh, with I would him love that these to people aren't crooks. Let us know. And if are any of these people still alive? Oh, you yeah. Just uh, Rabbi, well, the funny thing is one of the leading crook was Rabbi Israel Singer. Uh, he used to wear his yarmulke askew. And what happened was he ended up losing his position because he opened up, <laughs> it's funny, a secret Swiss bank account where he squirreled away money from the World Jewish Congress, he said, for his retirement. And so and he was caught. All right. He was caught in Edgar Bronfman, who was the head of the World Jewish Congress. Uh, he ended up saying that Singer was a thief and kicked him out of the World Jewish Congress. Bert Newborn, he went around going, uh, saying he's doing all of this pro bono, pro bono. What it turned out, I used to call him the pro bono Holocaust huckster. Uh, he's at NYU now, and he's a big liberal. They all love uh, Bert Newborn. He got four million dollars from the Germans. He sat on the foundation and he took four million dollars from the Holocaust Survivors uh, Foundation. Then... That's so what? Because he was their lawyer? Yeah. But that's not unusual? No, but he was going around saying, I'm doing all of this pro bono for needy Holocaust victims. And then he took another six or seven million he asked for from the Swiss case. It was so outrageous that the New York Times ran an editorial personally directing it at Bert Newborn, this crook, and said, what are you asking here? You're billing $750 an hour, and you call okay. yourself pro bono? Let me tell you something, why it makes me so angry. Because both of my parents were survivors of the Nazi Holocaust. You know what my mother got? For being in a uh, Maidana concentration camp and two slave labor camps, you know what she got? She got $3,000. That's what she got. And when she was alive, I was the one who shepherded her from lawyer to lawyer, from what was called, the, the, there were all of these Jewish organizations, uh, United Restitution Organization, they were supposed to give you money. And they wouldn't give her a cent. And they were raking in all this cash for themselves and claiming to do it for my parents' suffering. It made me sick when I saw what was going on. It was a complete racket, and it was a racket at the expense of the real survivors. Real survivors never got a dime. It's a very interesting story. I go through it, you know, quite <laughs> in probably uh, painful detail for most people in the expanded edition of the Holocaust industry. The Holocaust industry actually started off like 120, 30 pages. By the end, it's now about 350 pages because I added in all the detail about the Swiss banks case and all the other cases. But these people, you know, they were making a fortune over my parents' suffering. Okay. My, father got, my father, incidentally, he did get a reasonable pension, but you want to know why? Because the money was paid out by Germany. And every month, until the last day of his life, every month was a blue envelope. It came from Hanover, I remember, because I was also the executive for my father. And the check would come. You had to go to the German consulate to present papers to certify he was still alive. Because, you know, the survivors are dying, which is another aspect of the whole fraud. You ask me, how do I know it's a fraud? There's a very simple reason why. In 1945, the war is over. How many Jews survived the concentration camps, the, labor, the slave labor camps and the ghettos? The whole point of the Nazi Holocaust was its efficiency. As Raoul Hilberg said, it was an assembly line, factory-like extermination of the Jews. Very few survived. 
the figure is probably under 100,000 Jews actually survived the Nazi Holocaust. So we're now in the 1990s. The average survivor, the average survivor was about 20, something around 25 years old. Because if you were older than that, the Nazis exterminated you. And if they were younger than that, the Nazis exterminated you because they wanted healthy people who can work at the end. So unless you were of a, a, a vigorous physical uh, constitution, you were killed. That's yeah. the whole point of the Nazi Holocaust. So like my, both my parents were about you know, 20, uh, 24, in the 25 year old uh, range. So we're talking about now the late 1990s. Do the math. Who's alive? My parents died 20 years ago, actually this year. My father died this month, January 21st. My mother, October 19th. Um, they were all dead. All of this thought, they were talking about millions okay, of Holocaust I get back survivors. To, to your, the, the kind of consequences of you and the choices you made. Mm -hmm. So this book comes out. You're teaching mm -hmm. at uh, Hunter College, Hunter College. Mm -hmm. um, and about a year later, you go to DePaul. Well, I didn't go to DePaul. <laughs> a year later, I was unceremoniously kicked out of Hunter College. And uh, at that point, I don't want to turn this into a you know, martyrdom, but I had been kicked out of every school in New York, and there was just no place to go anymore. Uh, I was pretty desperate. You I, mean, I, I actually... Uh, I'm not exaggerating. I, anyone who knows the story, and I have close friends who can confirm, I loved Hunter College so much. I loved that school. It was a real working class students. A lot of them were immigrant kids, a lot of them from the Caribbean, uh, and they were first generation. They were so thrilled at the prospect of being in college. And they were also thrilled because a lot of them worked at these mindless jobs during the day of having their ideas, their mind validated in class. They can think. They were, their ideas counted for something. It was so exciting to teach at Hunter College. I loved it. I was there from 1992 to 2000. I begged them to keep me. I begged them. I said at the last uh, meeting, or last conversation with the chair, uh, Kenneth Sherrill, I said, just give me two courses a semester two courses, that would be $12,000 a year. You're laughing, that's what I earned. Uh, $3,000 per course you were paid at Hunter back then if, as an adjunct. No health insurance, nothing. Just give me two courses in spring, uh, in uh, fall, and two courses in spring, and I'll do it. I'll do it for the $12,000 a year. It was two hours going each way, because Upper Hunter's in the Upper East Side of Manhattan. I live down by Coney Island. I didn't care. I loved Hunter College. Just give me two courses. Right. And you know what he said to me? He said to me, well, even if we had two courses, even if we had two courses, you'd have to come in on two separate days. See, the way they used to do it for adjuncts is because you're being paid nothing, they would give you three courses back to back to back. So Tuesday and Thursday, back to back to right. back, or, or Monday and Wednesday, back to back. So. In order to teach two courses, which were on different days, I'd have to come in four days a week. But you, mm -hmm. when you wrote Holocaust Industry, mm -hmm. and you take on the, the, the primary narrative yeah. for the existence of the state mm -hmm. of Israel, mm -hmm. and you take on a whole question of what mm -hmm. you're calling corruption, mm -hmm. you've got to know there's going to be such no. consequences. You see, Paul, you don't know these things in advance. Remember, I'm a nobody. I'm a nobody. I published with a tiny left-wing press, Verso Books. Nobody reviews books from Verso. And I'm a nobody. You know what my advance, you know, people said, oh, you made so much money off the Holocaust industry, they called me, you're another Holocaust huckster. You know what my advance was for the book? I could tell you, it was $2,000. Nobody thought it was going to be a, uh, create a huge ruckus. We just figured it would be another left-wing book, you know, read by so, a very small so group of people. So when it comes out... The only thing that is true is <laughs> the lawyers went crazy over the book. They roll up uh, the Verso lawyers, which is a left-wing press. They wrote up 10 pages of stuff they wanted to take out. By the time we finished with the 10 pages, there was no book left. And my, uh, the, the head of the Verso books at the time, who's now my publisher in a, in a new publishing house, Colin Robinson, he was just wonderful. I'm eternally into his debt. He took all the lawyers 
criticism, flung it away. Mm. I, I don't care. Let's try it. Okay. The book comes out. You lose. They fire you at Hunter. I let, lost let, me, let me finish job. the question. Yeah. Let me finish the question. So mm. the, the, the accusations start to rain down on your head from all the Israeli propaganda machine. Mm -hmm. you know, Self-hating Jew, mm -hmm. Holocaust denier. Mm -hmm. um, th there, is, there is one piece of this, and I wonder, did it concern you? Not all criticism, obviously, of Israel's anti-Semitic, as some of pro-Israeli people would like to suggest. But some is. There really is uh, a, a virulent anti-Semitic yeah. trend in the world. We see it on our, our videos. Sometimes people ask, how come, you know, on our website, if you write the word Jew in the uh, comments, we have an automatic filter so we can find out if it's pure racism or an actual comment, because there is so much racist stuff that comes. And part of the critique you got from, you know, p uh, admittedly, you know, very pro Zionist, pro-Israeli positions, mm -hmm. that somehow you kind of reinforced the Holocaust denial. You were, talk, you were accused of being mixed up with the Holocaust deniers. Now, I'm not suggesting there's any merit to the argument, but how did it affect you emotionally, this tremendous uh, barrage well, against you? There, there are many things to say to that. First of all, uh, I was very close to my parents. Everybody who knows me knows that. Uh, I took care of them. They both died from terrible, terrible disease, uh, illnesses. My mother had a cancer which literally, not figuratively, it consumed her whole face. Her whole face turned into blood and boils. Whole th it was like out of a science fiction movie. My father had so a... melanoma or something. Uh, it, well, they could never find what they called the primary. They didn't know what was causing it. They couldn't diagnose it. Um, my father had Alzheimer's and he was a, he was a, a living corpse. Yeah, he was just... You would go to the hospital, they would say, pulse excellent, heart excellent. The only problem was he was dead, you know. The, so, and I cared for them. The, it always happens in families. The burden falls on one of the siblings, and it happened in my case, it was me. So I was very close to them and very close to their suffering, very close to it. I, I knew they carried it around with them every day of their life to the last moment. Sometimes I would try to make a joke but you couldn't joke about it. You know, like my father, sometimes he would fall out of bed at night and I'd say, well, what happened, what happened then? He'd say, oh, I had a nightmare, the Nazis were chasing me. So I said, well, the good news is you escaped. You know, and you no, know, those jokes fell flat. You know, it was horrible what they experienced and I cared. So there was no way, there was no way on God's earth that was going to ever diminish their suffering or um, uh, uh, there was no way I was going to diminish their suffering. And so when I was writing the book, I remember very clearly, um, it was like my parents were watching over me. Every word I was very careful of. Am I betraying my parents' legacy? Am I betraying what my parents went through? I was very careful about that. There is not one word in that book which my parents would recoil from. They would have had trouble with the book before where I wrote about Hitler's willing executioners and the claim that all Germans were pathological anti-Semites. And I, my parents felt that. I didn't agree with them. I never argued with them about it. I felt after what they went through, they're entitled to their opinions, even though I strongly disagree with them, but not the Holocaust industry. Quite the contrary, for those who actually read the book, take what we just discussed a moment ago. My late mother used to get infuriated when every time you meet anyone in the street, they say, I was a Holocaust survivor. You know, they're appropriating the horror that she went through as, as their own. And she used to get so exasperated. She would say, if everybody who claims to be a Holocaust survivor actually is one, who did Hitler kill? Who did Hitler kill? Everybody in me in New York says I'm a Holocaust survivor. Now that's a second generation Holocaust survivor. I mean, the whole thing is such a joke. If I ever went up to my mother and said I'm a second generation Holocaust survivor, you know, she would smack me. What do you mean second generation Holocaust survivor? You know what, the Holocaust, you know what it was? So 
Uh, no, I was very careful, but it's also true. It's no doubt true, and I'm, I try to be objective about these things. I attracted a lot of the wrong people. Uh, there's no question about that. There were actually stories which they were so insane, they were funny. Everybody has his or her ego. I'm not immune to ego. I'm invited, invited to this two-day conference in Italy, and it's an academic conference devoted to my book. Well, as you can imagine, it was in a place called Teramo in Italy, a beautiful, beautiful, uh, like a ski resort. I'm thrilled. I'm, how, I'm going to have a two-day conference for my book. I mean, now I'm really made it, you know. <laughs> so the guy picks me up at the airport. We go for dinner, and he... Um, introduces me to his friends, and he introduces me as a, I, when I say the guy, the professor who organized the conference, he introduces me as a Holocaust revisionist. What do you mean, Holocaust revisionist? That was the term used back then for Holocaust and I said, I'm not Holocaust revisionist. He says revisionist, revise. We're always revising. That's what history is about, revising. So I said, no, we're not revising. I'm not a Holocaust revisionist. Then, after this dinner, we're already, I'm beginning to think, Norm, your ego, I think, has gotten you into some trouble here. He, he tells me in the car, let me see some of, the, let me show you some of my publications. So I'm a typical academic. He gives me the publications. I immediately flip to the footnotes. Academics don't read text. They just look at footnotes. And I see Lyndon LaRouche <laughs> all over the footnotes. By the way, you better quickly tell people who I know he okay. is. But let he was an he was an extreme leftist who turned into an extreme rightist and a complete lunatic in the former incarnation and the later incarnation. Back to the leftist. Back to the rightist. <laughs> yeah. Back to the leftist. So now, uh, now they got a thing about the Sauds. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I see the footnotes are interspersed. Larouche Chomsky. Larouche Chomsky. Larouche Chomsky. I think. Uh oh. Chomsky, fine, LaRouche, big problems. So now I'm beginning to sweat. And I think, I better get myself the hell out of here. <laughs> what did I get myself into? Then I said, no, no, no. I mean, remember what John Stuart Mill says, all sides should be heard. And as long as they're letting you speak your mind, you should let others speak their mind. <laughs> OK, so now I'm drawing my million liberalism. He takes me to the conference. It turns out to be a two-day conference on Holocaust denial. Mm. Oh, my Lord. What I got myself into. Sounds like what they keep organizing <laughs> in Tehran every so often. Right. You must have been invited I'm to those. Invited, yeah, I'm invited all the time. Yeah. Um, we always argue about that, by the way. Me with the Iranians. Why I won't show up? Uh, so then the guy who introduces me, the one who organized the conference, uh, he starts going through this long introduction. By the end of the introduction, he's proved that it was the Jews who killed John F. Kennedy. <laughs> so when it came to my turn, I said, let me begin by saying, this guy, he's a nut. He's a complete lunatic. <laughs> and the funny thing is, at the end of the whole thing, I thought I, I really insulted him throughout. He came up to me, shook my hand vigorously, he said, good, good. Different points of view is very good. All right. In the next segment, we're going to talk about some of the consequences of all of this because not, you didn't just lose your job at Hunter. Mm -hmm. You wound up getting isolated over the next few years. You go to DePaul, but then you lose that job and you essentially get isolated by the uh, American and even Western academic community. Mm -hmm. Including, including the leftist. Okay, we're going to talk about that in the next segment. Please join us for a continuation of our series with Norman Finkelstein on Reality Asserts Itself on the Real News Network.